you know, when you go out today, uh, I offer you just my own experience. You don't have to spend more money than the other side. That's actually truer today than it used to be. Um, with the internet, and you look at the Tea Party, the Tea Party, part of what makes something like that possible is the internet communication that we can do. And more people know more details about policy issues being debated today than I've ever seen before in my adult lifetime. And I think for a very long time. It's, it's wonderful to watch people show up at their congressman's town hall meeting and know more about what they're asking the congressman about than the congressman. <laughs> chin for that, and uh, in 10 days, I hope they take it on the chin for the last time, yes. and uh, in that capacity. Um, but I'm also seeing, like I've never seen before in my lifetime, a willingness and an interest among ordinary citizens <coughs> to learn or relearn, depending on what happened the first go-round, their constitution and the first principles of this country, and what they really mean which is what they meant when they were written. The principles embodied there are timeless, which means they apply as much in 2010 as they did in 1776. And when I am going door to door in Fairfax, uh, through three state senate races, talking about first principles in a fairly evenly split district, you get this kind of glazed over look. How does that, you know, how does that affect transportation? Well, let me tell you, you know, I'm very enthusiastically connect the six degrees of Kevin Bacon and, and uh, we get there. But I will tell you this, uh, this administration and Nancy Pelosi, boy, she's entertaining, isn't she? <laughs> you know, if you just set aside that she's wrecking the country, it's, she says a lot of funny things. Uh, you know, uh, at least for those of us who take the Constitution seriously. Madam Speaker, where where does it where do you think you get the power to order people to buy health insurance? Are you serious? Well, as a matter of fact, we are. As we walk to the courthouse to demonstrate that. And now that we passed the bill, we can learn what's in it. Well, that's a great idea. Well, we're learning. And um, and the more people learn, the less they like it. The less they like it. It is quite an extraordinary process. Not how the president told his caucus it would go. Oh, let's just vote this thing. I'll go sell it. And, you know, this is Lee at Gettysburg. He thought he could sell anything. Um, he ran one of the best campaigns we've ever seen. But campaigns, I can tell you, as someone, I got a business degree after law school, so it's sales, marketing, and communication. Yes. Governing is something entirely different. So different it's on the other hand. And this administration didn't run on any consistent philosophy other than the centralization of federal power and expansion of it, but with no specifics. So now America has seen the meat go on the bones and they don't like it. They don't like it. They don't like the federal governments doing two things, clearly reducing their freedom without question, and in a way that reduces their opportunity. And that is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that the attack on liberty has horrific economic results. Horrible economic results. And you can think of any piece of legislation they passed, whether they intended or not, for it to improve the economy. And some days, I don't know whether they actually believe this stuff they say, or it's just trying to delude other people, if they really think any of what they've done is going to improve the economy, um, they clearly skipped economics. Tell people I'm, I look Italian, I'm half Irish, and then the other half, economically, I'm Austrian. So, <laughs> and, uh, and these folks haven't taken Econ 101. Um, I'm not sure many of them have taken math. Uh, but. Uh, but boy, they know how to swipe a credit card, don't they? But, um, they're spending our kids' money, yeah, big time. Um, but until the only way that gets fixed is work over the next 10 days 
and it doesn't end on November 2nd, no matter what happens on November 2nd. No one election for no one office or in any one year changes this. We are on a new path as a country. And if we aren't, we're dead in the water anyway. This is years long, and you all need to be engaged for the long haul. You need to pray for this country, and you need to show up year in and year out. Because this is going to take a while to fix. We aren't just fixing. Let me be really clear. We aren't fixing 18 months. We didn't get here because of the Democrat Party. You can go back 10 years when the Republicans owned the House, the Senate, and the Presidency, and they shot spending through the roof. Through the roof. They got this ball rolling. It's a little bit more than I can stand to watch some of this leadership then get up and say, well, we need real health care reform. Well, where were you when we wanted to get the government out of the way? Because that's the real health care reform. That's the real way to fix the economy. and say, well, you're, you know, $800 billion stimulus, that's too much. You can't spend more than $700 billion on things like that. Like we did. And, um, it, it, you know, and, and only six months later, no moral authority, no moral authority to condemn the spending aspect of what's going on in Washington. And should it surprise anyone, regardless of party, that that path, that massive, or for you all, Graph left to right, uh, that path in spending would lead us to a government that also doesn't respect the boundaries of its constitutional authority. That is an absolutely natural progression. And for anybody who thought, well, we could do all of this, but surely we won't have that problem. Um, for the first time in history, we'll be a government that doesn't have that problem. Uh, was foolish. It was foolish. You all remember, you saw Reagan flash through there quickly when they hit the wrong file. But uh, uh, never a bad one to hit, though. Uh, you remember him talking about the economic pie. You can grow the pie by shrinking taxes, tax rates, and, and uh, the pie can shrink, as we're seeing it do, uh, with different government policies. Well, I talk to people about the liberty pie. The liberty pie doesn't change size, and there are only two slices government power, and citizens' liberty. And it's a zero-sum game. There are three things government does to increase its power. Raise taxes, increase spending, and those two don't necessarily go together with a government that doesn't have a balanced budget requirement. But everything new the government does, even if they don't take your money now to do it, of course they're taking your children's, still increases government power. It increases their reach in our society and in the world, and it increases their power. And the third is increased regulation. And that can be in the form of a piece of legislation like the health care bill, or it can be in what we normally call regulation, like the EPA greenhouse gas endangerment finding. Those three things are the ways government increases its power. Republicans did two of them for the whole time they were in power. They didn't raise taxes. I'm not quite sure if you think you can just run a credit card forever why you'd ever bother. Um, and they didn't. But I will tell you this, I'm a strong low taxes guy. Steve also mentioned you me fighting a sales tax referendum in Northern Virginia. We were outspent 25 to 1. And every elected official in Northern Virginia, save one, voted for it. Every single one. And um, it looked like a fool's errand to oppose it. It was one of these things you ask people in polls, and of course the good citizen answer is, oh yes, I'll certainly tax myself. Strangely enough, they the voting booth and voted differently. How about that? What happened? People woke up is what happened. Because we, we, we talked to them about what it really meant. And, and, uh, and the bad governance that they were getting. Those people will respond, and I am, what gives me hope, the real kind, is that people are educating themselves, they are learning these policies, they are 
uh, sort of homeschooling themselves uh, about the Constitution and first principles and how this applies in the real world. But until we have a Congress and a President who, as a matter of course, respect the proper boundaries, boundaries the Founding Fathers would recognize as being appropriate for this government, we aren't going to be, we, this country isn't going to be where it needs to be to maintain liberty, to protect it for our children, and to continue to serve as the city on the hill for the rest of the world. For all of our challenges, uh, it is amazing. You look around, uh, the, around the world, we're still the best. This is the best country in the history of the world. We are led by people who do not believe that. They do not believe that, and they are wrong about that and many other things. They are wrong. But being graded on a curve, yeah, you know where that one's going. We've got a lot of work to do. And we have, I see some military hats here. I want to thank you all for your service, all our veterans. to get us to the point in history where we are now. And I don't believe that the foundation of this country has been so threatened in a very long time. And we're doing it to ourselves. But that also means we have the power to fix it. It's in our hands. It's in our hands. And the only people who ought to be faulted are the ones who sit around and say, well, I can only do a little bit. Well, I got news for you. As a guy who's won every race with hundreds of people in state senate races, and our state senate districts are about a third of a congressional district. So we had extraordinary numbers of volunteers. Um, and then one statewide being outspent by over a million dollars because of people on the ground who believe, not, <clears throat> not in Ken Cuccinelli, but in the first principles of this country and that they're worth fighting. That's what's going to change this country. And we can do this. Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs>